Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third webinar in our four-part Asset Operations Live webinar series. I'm so excited to be hosting today's panel discussion. We have some amazing industry experts, along with Ryan Chan, Upkeep's founder and CEO. Now, in today's panel, we will be discussing the benefits of measuring teams based on why they do something rather than what they do. Our panelists will be answering questions related to continuous improvement as an abundant life cycle, which Ryan will explain in further detail. Now, before we introduce our panelists, I just have a couple of housekeeping items to quickly cover. Now, today's session is being recorded and will be available on demand following the conclusion of the event. And time permitting, we will host a brief Q&A session at the end of the conversation. So please submit your questions in the panel to your right, and we'll try our best to get to as many as possible. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ryan to kick off today's panel discussion. Ryan, take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Blair. Uh, real quick for everyone, uh, I, I want to really try to engage everyone. If you've been to a few of these webinars, you kind of know like my, my MO here. But drop in the chat where you're watching from, what your role is, and what company you work for. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to try to you know keep this as engaging as possible. So, um, really appreciate everyone's um, you know participation and attendance. All right, welcome. Um, my name is Ryan. I'm your host. I'm also the CEO and founder of Upkeep. Uh, today we have a really special panel discussion. Um, a little bit of background before we jump in. All right, welcome Chris, Lisa, um, and also Corey. Um, a little bit of background for today. Back in 2021, Upkeep brought maintenance, reliability, and operations together in this one approach called asset operations. And as of just last month, we've completed our book on asset operations and why it's critical for the future of our industry. Um, I'm really excited to announce it's here. You can actually purchase our book uh, on the Amazon um, store. You can also get it on Kindle, and also I believe we have our audio version coming out in the next few weeks too. So if you listen to books and not read books like I do, um, that's also <laughs> a great option. Um, all right, so this book would not have been possible without all the amazing, amazing contributors from both the Upkeep team, the community, and also our subject matter experts. You know, three of our subject matter experts that we have here today on this panel. So I'm really, really excited to have, you know, both Rob, Michael, um, and also, where did George go? Is George still here? <laughs> I hope so. We've got three amazing contributors here on this panel today. All right, before I introduce our panelists, we have some amazing, amazing guests here with us. we got Rachel, Gerardo, Jessica, Cristiano, Blair. Okay, oh, Blair's here. <laughs> and also Matthew. Thank you again for joining live. Um, Blair just posted the link to purchase the book on Amazon. All right, I'm going to get into our, our talk here. All right, so we've got three amazing, amazing guests. We've got Rob Kalvaruski, George Mahoney, and Warren. Um, just to give some context behind each one of these amazing guests, we've got Rob Kalvaruski, who's a high performance leadership coach at Elite, Elite High Performance. We have George Mahoney, who's a program manager and business optimization lead at Merck. And last but not certainly last but not least, we have Michael Morin, who's the facilities and venue director at JAFCO. So it's great to have each one of you here to celebrate the launch of our asset operations book and talk about your unique experience in this field. So do you want to all go around and share a little bit, little uh, quick introduction behind yourself and you know how you got introduced to the, the industry? And maybe we could start with Michael. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, actually, I wound up getting introduced to the industry from the hospitality side of the world. And uh, I was a, an operations manager for a restaurant group where chaos was the order of the day every minute. And when it came to facilities, operations, and management, the only thing that came up constantly was a question mark, which was what to do next. So very quickly, I, I came to love uh, this little app that someone had on their phone called Upkeep, because uh, sanity was on the way very quickly after I started to uh, work with it. And that was some years ago. And honestly, I've, uh, I've enjoyed using it and still do. That's awesome. Thank you, Michael. Um, Rob? 
Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, Michael, I don't know what you're talking about with this whole chaos is, is all the norm thing. <laughs> um, no, so I'm Rob. I spent probably 10 years in maintenance, started off in mining, did some consulting across heavy industry and then ended up in oil and gas. And for about the last year, I've been working full time as a leadership coach because what I saw over those 10 years was really a huge gap in the leadership styles and the ability for us to drive change and sustain the reliability initiatives and get the value that we're looking for. So that's where I've pivoted this last year. And really since then I've been, I've coached over 80 leaders and we're really rolling out some really game changing stuff. So definitely it's been fun. All right. Thank you, Rob and George. So uh, I've been in maintenance since I was 10 years old working on my father's heating and air conditioning truck. And uh, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to go play with my friends. So I hated waste. I wanted to get the jobs done as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of waste in Staten Island. There's a lot of traffic. There's uh, the people at the supply shop that don't show up on time. There's customers that don't show up on time. My dad had all of his customers on a roll decks with pen and paper, and he actually did do some like uh, some history on what we did to people's houses the last time. So that's really where I got the feel for it, the passion for it, and I've been involved in maintenance and or continuous improvement ever since. So it was a long journey for me, but I did it from the age of 10 to the age of 37 sitting on my dad's heating and air conditioning truck. So I'm glad to be here today to talk more about it. All right, and it's great to have the three of you guys join us today in today's panel discussion. Um, George, thank you for being an upkeep customer. Rob, it's been am amazing watching your journey too. And George, yeah, starting from 10 years old, haven't left the industry. Love it. All right. Um, before we jump into the panel questions, I want to set the tone for today's discussion and quickly go over what asset operations really means. So our vision, my vision behind asset operations is to unite the operations and reliability. <laughs> During uh, our, our vision here is unite maintenance operations reliability into one single team to help all, this one team asset operations make important biz, business decisions with the full visibility of the entire life cycle of an of uh, of the asset across you know the installation purchase commission to ongoing maintenance and ultimately the decommissioning of the asset. You know, the vision here, unite these three teams and make decisions across the entire life cycle of the asset. And um, really the asset operations vision is where these three teams work together, share a single data repository for the foundation of communication and collaboration and view the entire asset life cycle and shift their business decisions focused on what they do and instead shift it to why teams do what they do. So again, that's um, a big pillar of today's discussion and what we'll be talking about, shifting this perspective from measuring teams based off of what they're doing, how many hours they work to what's the outcome of why they do certain actions and why we do certain PMs versus you know, again, hours work, PMs completed, work orders, um, you know, we hit the check mark off of. All right. So today, this is the third part in our four part webinar series where we're going to be talking about, you know, the, the eight pillars of asset operations. We're going to be hyper focusing on, on um, two of them. Oh, do we need to highlight the slides? Is it pinned? I think it's pinned. Let's see, did that help? Hopefully that one helped. All right. <laughs> um, the goal here is to basically talk about the two key um, pillars. One, continuous improvement is not just a point in time, but instead it's an abundant life cycle. And the second one is measure teams based off of why they do something, not just based off of what they're doing. All right, let me... Um, end the screen share and jump into our panel discussion. So it's less of me talking and more of 
you know, the, the three of you guys talking. All right, let me let me just quickly uh, introduce the first question. So we've got these two pillars in mind. And so the first question that I want to ask and direct is actually towards Rob. In the book, we talk about continuous improvement as this abundant life cycle. So I want to ask you, Rob, you know, you, you'd worked in, man, in maintenance reliability, and now you're kind of working on the coaching side, you know, what does continuous improvement mean to you? And how did these initiatives, how, how did continuous improvement work at the, your previous organization you know, before you transitioned into in the leadership coaching? Absolutely. For me, so continuous improvement, there's a lot of the different modalities, you know, PDCA, Kaizen, Six Sigma, whatever it is. But basically what we're looking for is when we do a task, we want to get feedback. We want to use the feedback to improve it, right? That's basically the nuts and bolts. And this takes a growth mindset. And this is really where I coach a lot these days is how we think about ourselves, how we think about a task and how we think about feedback. Often we think feedback is negative because it means we didn't do something perfectly. Right. And the other side of it is often a lot of folks get feedback only, you know, half every six months or once a year. Right. Because it's part of their performance review. It should be all the time. Right. And, and I love this example, but someone said I was listening to a pod the other day and someone said, like, do you how often do you think Michael Jordan got feedback? And it's like, do you think it was once every six months? And that's exactly the same thing here in maintenance, right? Is like, if we're going out and someone sees something wrong with the PM, we should never wait six months to get it done. We should make the change immediately or feed it back into the system so then someone can understand, hey, this is what needs to change, then we should try to always improve. We struggle with this as an industry because of our mindsets in the we've always done it this way mentality. And that's where we have to start here to start really impacting the results that we're getting. Yeah. So I feel, and George and Michael, feel free to jump in here, but I feel like maintenance is, often has this perception of like, yeah, it breaks, we go fix it. And it hasn't really, to your point, Rob, transitioned into this mindset of continuous improvement. It's more, it breaks, we go fix it, we go home, you know, that's it. Why? Why have we gotten to this state? And um, what what could what we could or what should we be doing? doing? There's so much to fix, right? It's exactly what Michael said, right? Is we right now, generally almost every facility deals with chaos. And so you're running around fixing things so you don't have time to plan ahead. And it's it's partly that second point that you have, Ryan, where it's like folks don't know the value of the work they're doing. So it's whatever's the most or the biggest fire right now is where I'm doing. And so it takes planning, it takes understanding, and it takes direction to sort of prioritize work in an effective way, both for yourself as a reliability professional or even in your life or as a maintenance organization. Yeah. You know, the yeah. long-term decision-making ability, first of all, I, I think you got to remove the accountants from the equation, right? Because we look at everything we measure, you know, we manage what we can measure, right? We've all taught that. But when it comes down to it, we're still measuring things the same way we did in 1800. And that's the result you get, right? You buy a building and you wait till it falls down. Now, we're all involved in changing that. So, like, here's some things that, you know, to think about. I mean, above my head, I have 25 air conditioners, four tons and up. So, like, if I don't get out in front of those, that one of those is going to fall on my head one day. But, like, having those maintained and taking care of those and keeping them all working when it's 90 degrees is a real, like, it's, it's no longer a joke. So taking that seriously, but I think being able to get the decision makers to see that life cycle, 
to understand the investment from the beginning. And, you know, what we're really about here is saying, okay, I know when that life is going to end and I'm already planning for it. We're putting reserves aside. And when the time comes, we're going to replace it. That's logic involved in the equation. And I think the more that that's brought to the, you know, the big meetings, the more uh, credence it's going to get and allow us to not only have better construction, but a more longevity of the assets that we purchase. Yeah. You know, this idea that like, you know, continuous improvement is so key, critical to any maintenance reliability operations team. I mean, that that is at least something that I believe in so much. One, because, you know, obviously this continuous improvement helps all of us be better. But two, like it helps improve morale. And at the end of the day, people get tired of doing the same thing every single day. But this idea of con continual improvement it actually motivates a lot of people, you know, and people want to improve. People want to get better than they were yesterday. And Michael, you know, uh, you know, we kind of interviewed you for the, the asset operations book. And, you know, in the book, you stated that, you know, your team at the beginning, um, morale was actually really low. Oh, they, um, were, so they, were, they were out the door any minute. I mean, yeah, really yeah, yeah. Everybody I was mean, like, morale yeah. was low. Yeah. Chaos was high. Um, but it sounds like you and the team have really come together to switch this like low morale to a high performing, high functioning team, um, yes. pulling and rowing in the same direction, in the same boat. I, I kind of want to ask you, like, you know, how did you do that? You know, how, how did you get the team focused on the same goal? I, I think the, the first key to that was really um, doing a all, whole lot of listening. And, and understanding the plight of the maintenance people when I got here, uh, understanding how things were being done and not being done. And, and then like not necessarily promising any solution, but saying, okay, we're gonna work at this together. So we started really, the big, the big thing was communication. And once the communication started to uh, you know, improve, in the beginning, everybody told me what I wanted to hear, which is as the boss, you expect that. Uh, but, you know, over time, I think we developed some trust and started to see some progress and, uh, you know, um, people were contributing and now my guys, I don't do work orders anymore. They do the work orders. You know, I just kind of, you know, they tell me what's happening and what's going on. Um, but it really is genuinely everybody working together and, you know, on a, on a daily basis, I walk the buildings, I walk the floors. I know everybody's name. They know where, where I'm going, what I'm doing. And I think that that technology piece, uh, upkeep, you know, what it does for me is it allows me to pull my phone out of my pocket and look and know that the problem on the roof got taken care of without having to stop somebody, you know, from what they're already working on another, another issue. So, you know, what we're looking at is a moving target and continuous improvement to me means that the the culture is such that like we're we're more of an attitude of what do you got next bring it on you know we're going to get this taken care of what's the next thing and you know we get together on mondays and fridays and what we do is like mondays the bright light of ideas fridays the bitch session and so <laughs> we didn't get a chance to take care of why we couldn't get it done whose fault it is all that stuff but the only thing about the bit session is only from 9.05 to 9.15, 10 minutes. That's it. After that, we got to move on to something else. So, you know, everybody comes with their guns loaded for that, and we made it kind of fun. But at the end of the day, you know, that made it very clear what our obstacles were to success. And a lot of times it was just straight up legend BS Somebody told somebody they couldn't get a part because something wasn't available. You know, I mean, okay, did you try it yourself? Well, no, I, somebody else told me. I mean, you know, I, I was told I couldn't get yellow paint for the safety curbs in front of my building. So I just stopped at a paint store on the way here, and I went in, and I asked them, and I bought it. And, you know, everybody was amazed. They said, no, it's five years. You're not going to be able to get any. And, you know, I think a lot of um, – a lot of success in my team has to do with right now. They know I'm not taking no for an answer and like do your homework and bring me a solution to the problem. I got enough problems. I got plenty of problems. 
don't bring me another problem. Bring me a problem and an idea of maybe how to solve it. And they love that because now they're coming to me with solutions that, I mean, I don't have all the answers. And uh, they're coming up with some pretty good ones. So I'm so going to kind of keep going. That, what I hear from that is like kind of two things. One is like you just made – you enabled the team to – be okay with you know, talking about all the problems on, on the field. And then two is like you empowered them to be able to like say, okay, cool. We see problems. Now go find a solution. I think that's, that's transformation. I feel like many businesses, especially as we can, we talk about this idea of continuous improvement, that's where they struggle is the right. culture mindset of being okay with, you know, throwing out feedback, the good, the bad, the ugly, and also the great. Right. And if we talk about continual improvement, like that feedback piece is the number one most important thing. Absolutely. And it's also good to do it on Friday because then you could run right after. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, you know, George, yeah, I know that you have a ton of experience, like, you know, growing, hiring, recruiting teams, high performance, high functioning teams, you know, I want to hear from your experience. You know, ha have you run into struggles, challenges? Um, what have you done to motivate and retain you know, the, these teams that, that are high performing, that are open to feedback, that have this mindset of continual improvement? At least for me, this is what's worked the best. And this is, goes down to the individual level. Uh, is that you want to give an employee three things. The first one's autonomy. The second one's mastery. And the third one is purpose. So I didn't come up with this on my own. It's just, I researched it. And autonomy doesn't mean just, hey, uh, maintenance person, go over there and do whatever you want. But it's giving them the autonomy to lead their own charge. Kind of like what Michael was saying is, do you have a suggestion? Bring it up. Do you have an idea? Experiment with it. It's okay to fail, but we're not going to look over your shoulder and say, this is exactly what you need to do at every step of the way. And the second one was mastery. So how do I have an opportunity in this company to master my craft or maybe go beyond my craft and master something else? Or do you just want me picking up boxes, moving them here and there, and now I feel like I have no shot at getting better at what I'm doing? And the third thing is purpose, is what you're doing bigger than yourself. And, and I would relate that back to the why. You know, why, why am I even here? What am I doing? You know, we always talk about the what, but what is that? helping you with with respect to the why what's the purpose that's bigger than you when you're turning that wrench is it more important than you know just your your arm moving righty tighty lefty loosey or is there some sort of operation that's going to happen at the end of that where everybody's winning because you fixed that pump or that leak yeah that's awesome um so you know i i kind of mentioned in the beginning if you have questions drop it in the chat we're going to try to you know answer some of the questions live michael you got a question from uh jay kreiner here you know, he was wondering how long did that transformation take going from low morale to this high performance team where you're all rowing in the same direction? And then ultimately, when did you see that rudder change? Um, on the clock, I want to say three months. Um, and where it really started to change was when um, instead of me um, bringing work orders to the attention of my team, uh, them starting to get comfortable with it and do it themselves. And that's when I realized, hey, if I'm not careful, they'll be doing my job pretty soon, which is what my goal is. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I need to go to bat for them every single day. And if there's an issue, they know I'm going to fight the fight if it needs to be, uh, whether it's they need equipment or uh, tools or, you know, um, maybe something we can't do in-house. We need to get somebody from the outside, you know, whatever it might be. But I know that I need to follow up 100% from the minute they bring somebody to my attention. Otherwise, I'm going to lose that trust. And yeah. so, like now, I have one of my team members who was, you know, just nobody has respect for maintenance people, right? You're the maintenance guy. You know, the guy with the, the name on your shirt, it's not even your right name. I mean, I grew up with, uh, you know, in a construction family, and my dad spent 60 years working in construction in New York City, and I know how he came home at night and what kind of days he must have had along the way. So I completely avoid that uh, and do everything I can uh, to get my guys what they need, 
uh, and also right to the point. They need to stand and deliver. And I have their back if they do that. And so, you know, that's a, uh, that's not a lot to do with maintenance, but it's a lot to do with, you know, that continuous improvement thing. No one gets up in the morning and says, hey, I, I want to do a worse job than I did yesterday. But I do know this. If someone gets done at three o'clock in the afternoon and I give them a job to do at two o'clock and tell them they, they can go home when they're done, they get that job done. Now, if I <laughs> do the same job at eight o'clock in the morning, they'll still get it done at three o'clock in the afternoon. So I don't know, somewhere in there, I'm trying to bottle that energy and maybe between all of us, we can figure that out. But that enthusiasm is fantastic. That last hour, wow, that's like, you know, that's good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you're also getting a lot of questions about this idea of your bitch session. I think a lot of people really resonate with that because one, it opens the conversation, the door for feedback. And then two, it's kind of like this outlet for all the things wrong within the organization. Be okay with kind of like pointing that out. Um, yeah. How do you scale the bitch session? <laughs> Chris is asking for you know, a team that has, you know, let's call it like 40 people uh, on the team. How do you make sure that? Well, you how, you how do you scale with, it? Yeah, you got to go with a write-in system then for the, uh, you know, the bigger groups because, you know, there's only one of you. You'll never make it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think you really need to, you know, digitally, you can certainly do that and, and you know, open up that pathway for people to uh, give you the items that they want to talk about in advance. But, you know, obviously, if it's 40 people, 50 people in a team, I'm sure you're going to find duplication of a lot of the issues. So that, that will help you. Yeah. Write it down. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> Anonymously. Anonymous. <laughs> oh, that's actually interesting. Anonymously. Okay. It has, okay. To be. It has to be anonymous. Yeah. 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 That way people are more open to, uh, you know, putting their feedback out there. Um, all right. Vocabulary too. <laughs> yeah. To get it, to make sure that the uh, HR team approves that to Mohammed's point. <laughs> um, all right. So Rob, uh, you know, you obviously deal with a lot of, you know, high impact leadership. Um, you know, as it relates to the, the sixth pillar of our book, focus on why, not the what. I want to ask you, Rob, why do you think so many companies right now are still focusing so much based off of activity? Why are they measuring success based off of the what, how many hours, how many work orders they completed, instead of the why they do that and the outcome of what they do? What's going on? I mean, it's easy, right? flat out right like it's easy like i know when someone clocks in at 7 a.m and leaves at four right i can measure that i have a punch card system or a swipe card or something right i know how many work orders they did in the day i know what parts they used i i can track all of this stuff like even some of the companies are going with like tracking how many emails you send and how many Teams chats you have and all this stuff, right? It's easy trackable. The value part is hard. And it's been something that even all, like across my entire career, no one's ever agreed on what's the value of some of the work that you're doing. And that part is, is hard, but it also takes like leadership that thinks. Right. And that's where Michael is is gone. Right. It's like you have to think about what is the long term strategy? Where do I want to go with my facility? What's the life cycle of it? Like you have to ask yourself these questions in advance so then you can make a better decision. And that's hard. Because often it's like what we're looking at is what's the next quarter result? How can I cut costs today? Because I have to make it better, you know, my earnings per share better. You know, like this is what we're looking at. And it's hard to get from next quarter to 50 years from now, which is the true decision that you want to make. Yeah, It's also something that people naturally struggle with. So yeah. like we as people we will avoid pain in the short term rather than setting ourselves up for gain in the long term. So it's a human problem more than just a, hey, leaders are bad. Like 
it's it's not our fault. It's it's how our brain works. Um, yeah, but I mean, the other question that that was asked, right, is like, how do we start engaging folks? And absolutely, George and Michael both had incredible results for this. Um, there's a reason. I mean, obviously, for um, somebody asked, you know, what are some Jessica asked so many resources like Simon Sinek has start with why there was a recent um, research out of Adam Grant who talked about purpose and they saw an incredible amount. It was like 172% higher profitability for companies that actually have purpose for people's roles. And this is just a this shift. It's yeah. not even, you don't even have to change the job. You just have to change how people think about the job. And Ryan, Upkeep, is, you have done that really well with Upkeep in the way that you're changing the world through maintenance. You're not just a CMMS company, right? And that switch accesses intrinsic motivation, which is the real stuff that Michael's talking about where people flip the switch. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Rob. And I appreciate that. What I, what I really hear from, from that is like, it's this idea of constant, constant improvement. It's this idea of people wanting to get better than they were before. Um, but also that this shift takes time and it takes this like mental energy. And right now it's so easy to just say, okay, cool. Like we know to your point, how many hours you work, how many work orders you complete. That's the easy part. But if you really want to focus on this continual improvement, this idea that, you know, it's an abundant life cycle, not just a point in time, you have to stop. You have to think, and that requires mental energy. What I heard from Michael and you say is that oh, it sounds like you got your, um, let me use different terms here, Michael, but your strategy session on Mondays and your reflection days on Fridays. <laughs> and that, that's, that's the important critical piece. Yeah. George, uh, I want to ask you, like, how have you seen this in practice? How have you seen, you know, people move from measuring the what they do to the why they do that what's been most successful to you and your business you're on mute <laughs> oh, you might be on mute <laughs> well, i was i definitely was on mute so i i took a little stint in the energy world and we really did try to, to to go from a maintenance perspective how can we improve our maintenance to help us save energy but everything we did we, we really had to quantify and we had little brackets on it. Like, is this energy savings or this maintenance thing actually help us with production? And if it did, how many dollars did we save with respect to production? So we tried to tie it all back in. Uh, it just, it does remind me of the story and do not fact check me on this because it may or may not be true, but uh, there were three people working on St. Patrick's cathedral, these three bricklayers. And the, the first, I went up to all three of them. I'm a pretty old guy. So I went, this is pretty long ago, but I went up to the first one and said, uh, what are you doing? And the guy said, uh, oh, I'm, I'm here. I'm, this is my job. I'm trying to feed my family. And then I went to the second guy. I said, what are you doing? And he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a stonemason and I'm building a wall. And then I went up to the third guy. I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, uh, I'm building a cathedral. And I think that's, that's the mindset you want to have with everybody in your organization. And you need to make it visual. You need to post it somewhere. What, what is our goal? What is our why? And what are we doing to get there? And if you're not doing that thing, well, then stop doing it. But you have to feel that whatever you're doing is bigger than you just scrambling around trying to complete a work order and trying to get on with your day so that you're not completely and totally frustrated. Yeah. But yeah. for us, we made everything visual and you get what you emphasize. So don't emphasize a lot. Emphasize what you want and only emphasize that thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I love and I the like idea of making it visual, too. I think that's so important posting it up in your break room or on the shop floor. That's so critical. Um, Michael, any, uh, any other ideas that you've seen really lead to success um, for shifting the, the you know, focus of teams from what they're doing to why they do it? Yeah, I think that um, you know, part of the evolution was to create a, a hierarchy within the facilities team. 
where there wasn't one before. So uh, people have something to look forward to, more money, promotion, uh, new title, new responsibility to go along with it. Uh, and so, you know, that uh, was really a game changer uh, because everybody knows if they, you know, they work hard and they do a good job, they don't have to stay in the position that they're in. There's other spots that are opening up and we're growing, we're moving forward. You're, you're either part of it or you're standing still and nobody wants to do that. So, you know, that's, um, you know, that's real, um, you know, uh, real measurable impact on their person's job uh, every day. But also uh, I introduced the concept of flexible time for everybody's got issues outside of work with family or, you know, whatever it might be. And so we had a pretty stringent, you know, scheduling situation uh, that was making it hard for people to get to appointments and things like that. So um, I got everybody in a five days a year where they can do whatever they want with it. And uh, if they have a doctor's appointment, no questions asked and, and just, you know, they can do what they have to do, take care of things outside because that's important to us. Uh, and so, you know, it's not just the, uh, the work side of life, but also, you know, addressing the, the balance that one has in, uh, you know, work-life balance. And so scheduling was a, a big thing, uh, along with the financial side of it, being able to, you know, help people earn a little bit more money. Uh, motivation comes from within. And, and I think that the uh, ability that you have as a leader uh, in the way that you communicate with your teams has everything to do with whether they perceive that as a, a good job or not. Uh, and that has to do with how you communicate with them directly, but also how the uh, organization itself values what they do. So, yeah. you know, advocating for that uh, is just as important as the communication piece. Uh, I have to manage the people above me much more than I do the ones that are you know, uh, doing the, the work on the front line so that they understand the importance of, uh, you know, making good decisions on the front side of buying expensive pieces of equipment or uh, designing a structure or whatever it might be. Uh, and so in the long run, if I can show that that has a financial benefit, they're all in. Uh, yeah. But it does take a good amount of time to be able to get to that point. So my team... Uh, they perform well every day. Um, their appearance is important to me. And so everybody wears a uniform and it is their name on it. If they have a name on their uniform, it's their name. Uh, you know, because part of what we deal with every day, getting right to the point, guys, is a stigma, right? Like who's the maintenance guy? You can pick him out of a crowd, right? He, he wears uh, no belt. His pants don't fit quite well. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, one shoe is different from the other, whatever. We, we're like misfits in the world of, uh, you know, taking care of buildings. I, I resent that. You all resent that. And I think, you know, that's uh, uh, the best uh, case from, you know, building morale every day is because we're, st we're already starting at the very beginning with the perception that the uh, people doing this work, it's, it's a second choice. And for my guys, it's not a second choice. I mean, they, they're good at what they do and they like what they do. So, you know, that's, um, that's something that's really helped us. Michael, there's so much that you just said there that resonates with me. Um, you know, changing, shifting the perception of maintenance, not making it come from like a second choice perspective, but a first choice perspective. That, is, that means so much to me. And I resonate with that a ton. I love the idea of creating career pathing within, you know, your maintenance department because it goes back to this point of continuous improvement is an abundant life cycle, not just a point in time. People love to move up, be better than they were yesterday in incentivizing them both through their own career, through money, through, you know, just even titles, small things like that motivates everyone to be better. And um, again, shift the perspective of what maintenance was to this like, you know, first choice. I love that, Michael. Thank you. It also makes the Friday sessions better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we talked a lot. We talked a lot about shifting the strategy, the mindset and culture of, of people. 
to focus not just on the what we're doing to the why we're doing it and really shift culture from this idea of a point in time to now this continuous improvement life cycle. I want to go around the table here and just ask each one of you, Michael, Rob, and George, you know, if you have one nugget for all of the listeners in today's, you know, webinar, they can take away to really enact positive cultural changes on their organization, their department, what would that one nugget be um, to make sure that, you know, this positive cultural shift sticks? Anyone want to start us off? <laughs> I can start. I, um, for for I, me, I, I hope. Oh, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Rob? Go ahead, Michael. I would say, sorry, Rob, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I think just find your way, and everybody's way is different. Find your way to really tap into communicating with your team and, you know, be able to understand what it is that you're able to do to help them make their jobs better. And it's not going to be necessarily easy to get to that point, but it's worth every second. Yeah. Rob? I totally echoed that. It start with the you. And I, uh, we always start off with our own emotional intelligence and our own mindset. And so emotional intelligence actually accounts for 90% of what sets people apart from their counterparts. And so your performance is dictated based on how you feel. And often folks get stuck in the Michael bitch session all week, right? We, you've right. gone to facilities, I've seen it, right? And it's, we start to believe that we cannot impact change. We start to believe we cannot do what we want to do. We start to believe we cannot grow outside of the box that we're in. If we start understanding and looking at how do we feel and what do we actually believe, we can start to understand, hey, you know what? I can go to Home Depot and buy yellow paint, right? And that changes, that gives us authority to go out and do. And that changes how we feel and it changes our performance. So always start with yourself and start looking into what do I believe in? Is that really true? Mm -hmm. All right, George. One and night. for me, you, to get your culture to stick, it's got to be part of your DNA. And how do you make it part of your DNA? To me, it's all about habits. So your habits dictate your behaviors. Your behaviors build your culture. And how do you get your habits? You do a small thing every day. You got to do it a lot of times. Uh, it's, it's not really like how long you do it. It's how many repetitions you get at it over and over and over again. So for me, you know, we're looking at our facility. We need to fix every door in this facility. No, we need to fix that door. In fact, we need to fix that doorknob, right? We're just going to fix that doorknob. Did we fix it? Yes. Okay, let's go to the next doorknob, then the next one, then the next one. Now it's a habit. I'm not going to just walk by a broken doorknob. We're going to fix every single doorknob that there is. Or we're not. We're going to do something where we're not putting something in the hinge, so we're breaking the hinge on the door. So to me, it's about building those habits. And when you build that habit, it sticks. Now it's just part of your DNA. Yeah. So I absolutely love all those nuggets of, of advice for you know, all of our listeners of today's webinar. This idea of you know, starting with the why, building habits, you know, these are the things that will drive not just a point in time, a one-time shift, but instead this idea of an abundant life cycle. We're constantly improving, building in these habits into our daily work. These are the ideas that will change for a lifetime and not just, you know, something that we do once in a period of, you know, once every, I don't know, every 10 years. Um, Michael, Rob, it's been awesome. You know, I've learned so much through the three of you guys, and I hope that our listeners have as well. We have an extra couple minutes to answer any questions that our audience might have. So if you have any, drop them in the chat right now, and we'll try to get through as many questions as possible. And if we aren't able to, we'll try to follow up too and email directly to you. Um, 
you know, as people are kind of like typing in their questions right now, I just again want to say thank you to Michael and Rob and George for joining us, um, helping support our book, this vision of asset operations and, you know, all they do for our community. Thank you. All right. So we have a, a few questions. Let's see. Um, this is maybe the, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, well, we answered a lot of questions um, within, within the, the conversation already. But Corey just asked the question, what are some KPIs for maintenance teams that have worked to motivate people? This is a common question that we get, you know, because, you know, KPIs are so difficult. There's so many, you know, are they leading? Are they lagging? And are we, you know, through these KPIs, are we measuring what versus the why? Anyone want to kick us off with an answer to, to Corey's question? Don't use KPIs to motivate people. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're done. <laughs> no, no, but I'm serious. So, so this is, this is what we've, everyone on this panel has talked about right it's we're looking for intrinsic motivation right which is the purpose the meaning the why we're not looking for hey you know the glenn gary glenn ross first prize is the cadillac second prize is steak knives third prize is you're fired right because that is only short term that literally will work for a few months and then people will just, it'll just become normal, right? And so what we're looking for is this, why do people want to do the job well? And when I, we always coach folks on having a career conversation with their people. So the person, where did they come from to get to here? And where do they want to go from here to basically the end of their career or the end of their life? And then what skills can I develop for them to get them to where they want to go? And that could be literally I had a conversation with someone who works as an IT professional today and they want to open their own coffee shop. And it's like, okay, so what skills do you need to get to the coffee shop that I can help you with from now to then? Yeah. And that will help folks be motivated, not, yeah. hey, you know, fix 10 widgets today because that'll make you feel better. I mean, what I hear from that, Rob, is like, yeah, it's it's not so much that KPIs are terrible. It's about like making sure that the goals or what we're tracking ladders up to the why. And everyone has a different why. Every business has a different why. Why do we do certain things? Are we building a cathedral? You know, is that the why? Um, they, didn't, then, they didn't use KPIs when they built a cathedral. I can tell you that. I would try pizza <laughs> any day over that. <laughs> uh, food is a very good motivator, I have found. Yeah, Honestly. yeah. Just as a surprise, you know, all of a sudden food shows up. That's... <laughs> much more fun than trying to figure out KPIs. And I know I've done my share of that. <laughs> <laughs> Small little things. Yes. Uh, Cristiano uh, it, it asked the question, how can companies create or even help um, a professional with a consistent career plan? Maybe that, that's a good question for you, Michael. Well, I mean, it depends on what their plan is, but being flexible with, with scheduling, allowing someone to you know, maybe they need to study for a few hours, uh, you know, before their shift or in the middle of their shift, being able to make a space for that, or if they need to take a certification exam or a test. So now you're going to put on your mentoring hat and, and say, okay, like, you know, Robert rightly mentioned, uh, this isn't the person's last stop on the road, but they have a direction and they're sharing that with you, then, you know, how can I help make that happen? You know, maybe this is, uh, you know, another person that's going to, help me to get where I need to go, but maybe not forever. So I'm happy to do that. And what I, what I hear from that, Michael, is, yeah, again, like taking the time out of your day to better understand their why, better understand what they want out of their own careers, whether that's certifications and, you know, reading, education, training, like it, it does take time, but getting 
taking the time to better understand every single individual and their why is is so critically important um, so that you're building that consistent career plan for, for, for them. You know, and, and one thing I would make clear here, it's really important for all of us to look at retention of our people. Um, and so, you know, if they have other motivations on a selfish level, I'd much rather know up front, um, you know, if they're going to leave me in three months, six months, whatever it might be. But finding people right now in my market is very difficult. So, you know, I, I want to make sure that that's a priority for their experience. And then I'm on top of that uh, from the day that they're hired, you know, all the way through the first 30 days, the first year, you know, that, that we're in sync. Otherwise, I'm going to lose that person. And, you know, it's very costly for us to get somebody trained to the point where, right, where, where they're functioning on their own. Uh, so there's a, there's a benefit to that, too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I think we are right up on time. Again, I want to say thank you so, so much for our incredible panelists for participating in today's discussion. And to all of our listeners that attended live and who are also watching our, our replay too. I'm super pumped to hear everyone's feedback um, uh, on the book and today's webinar. Blair just posted the, the link on Amazon if you want to get your own copy of our asset operations book. I'd be really, really thrilled to hear everyone's feedback. You know, shoot me a note, shoot me a, 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 an email at ryan at upkeep.com. Um, lastly, before we wrap here, we actually have our fourth and last part of our webinar series that'll be in the next couple of weeks. Blair will also post, or I think she actually already did, post the link on how to register for the fourth and last um, series of our webinar series. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you again, Michael, Rob, George, every single one of the you know live attendees for participating to, in today's webinar. I really appreciate it. I've learned a ton. Um, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.